patterns of culture. This is a book title by an American cultural anthropologist, Ruth Benedict, who worked closely with Margaret Mead. It was a book I read and reread quite a lot early in my anthropological life, and I thought it was very exciting, and I also became an admirer of some of her other work, particularly her work on Japan, the chrysanthemum and the sword. The basic idea, according to Margaret Mead and endorsed by her, is that a whole culture is like a particular human being, a single personality enlarged. In other words, if you look at a human being, they have a consistent set of practices and beliefs and ways of being. And if you extend that to a whole culture, for example, British culture or uh, American culture or Japanese culture, you can have the confidence that there are these patterns. And it is that confidence which she demonstrated and illustrated in the Japanese book, which I found very refreshing. This is because I think I've been trained to break things down into small parts. So as both a historian and to a certain extent an anthropologist, I had looked at the micro. I had looked in my historical training, for example, at different periods, at different themes within different periods. So one would do an essay on Henry VIII and the Reformation or um, the Civil Wars or whatever. And these were little fragments. If it was a person, you were dealing with a thumb here, a, a nose there, and you didn't get an overall picture. And what um, Ruth Benedict promised in her books was that you could strive to get a picture of the whole person and how the thumb and the nose were related. And not only did she uh, suggest this, um, but she gave uh, a couple of examples. One was in relation to the American uh, native in Indian societies and America, where she, following Nietzsche, she divided them into two basic themes or personalities. One was Apollonian, which they were very peaceful, orderly, and so on. And the other uh, were followers of the god Dionysius, who believed in wildness and wine and revelry and so on. And so she kind of made categories of culture and certain cultures fitted into one and some into another. Now, it's a tricky business to do that because cultures don't just fit into boxes like that. But it was an interesting idea. And even more interesting, I found, was her book on Japan because I came uh, later in my life to study Japan. And wherever I went and whatever I read, I came back to Ruth Benedict. She's been heavily criticised, of course, as any masterwork is, and people say, oh, but not this. For example, her opposition between sin and guilt. Um, we have, um, in the West, we have sin cultures because we internalise a God, and uh, he tells us that we've been sinful, whereas um, outwardly in Japan, um, we have more more what she calls shame, that uh, if you are found out, if other people know about what you're doing. So we internalize with guilt, and they externalize on the surface with shame. Now that's clearly not correct. I mean, the Japanese have guilt and shame, and so do we. But it was an interesting idea. And other parts of that book, which deal with the contradictions because the chrysanthemum is beauty and the essential aesthetic of Japan and the sword is the violence. Other parts of the book are extremely good um, and haven't been superseded. And so if people ask me still one book to read about Japan, I am often tempted to suggest her book.
And what's more amazing is that she did it without, as far as I know, speaking much Japanese or reading it, and certainly never visiting it. It was a book written, so to speak, for commission, because during the Second World War, the uh, Japanese and the Americans um, started to fight each other uh, after Pearl Harbor. And the Americans needed to know something about the people they were fighting. And so um, either they asked or Ruth Benedict suggested that she would go through all the reports on Japan, all the historical other materials, and also interview um, the quite large number of Japanese who were in America. So she did do uh, remote field work, not actually visiting. And out of that, being very brilliant and having this intuition that Japan had a pattern of its culture, she created a picture of a whole Japan. So she doesn't, in the best anthropological tradition, she doesn't just deal with the economic or the social or the political or the religious. She uses categories that go between those. And so you get a plausible, interesting and well-written story uh, in which are embedded many of the central contradictions of Japanese culture as I've experienced it. Taking this modern model of a pattern of culture uh, has helped me, I think, in much of my later work, because as I rose up from studying particular parts of history, a particular century or a particular subject or a particular place like a village in Nepal, to trying to get a wider view of a whole country or civilization, then in order to do that, because it's very complex and um, may not work at all, you need the confidence to believe there is some pattern there that has um, that lies below the surface, like a pattern of a language or like a pattern of a, an aesthetic system. And Ruth Benedict's work gave me that confidence, as did her co-worker Margaret Mead and some of the other great American anthropologists. They, in some ways, were broader than the British anthropologists I was reading. The British anthropologists were wonderful on particular segments, kinship or religion or economics or whatever, but they weren't broad in that way that you find in uh, those two and later in people like uh, Clifford Geertz, Marshall Salins, and other great American anthropologists. So I really admire her work.